My name is Dr. Aaron Grantham. I'm from the uh, uh, Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City, and I'm joined by several interviewees of uh, uh, real CTO experts. We have Dr. Scott Harding, Dr. Sung Wan Lee, and Dr. Toshia Muramatsu. Uh, we're going to talk today about chronic total occlusions. We've had an excellent day in the CTO theater. We've looked at some, we've watched some live cases, all of them successful so far. Dr. Muramatsu did a great case today for us. And uh, we have uh, seen great lectures talking about CTO PCI, everything from indications to complications. And today we're going to focus on the existing literature in chronic total occlusion angioplasty, focus on indications, and uh, pay some special attention to the recently released Decision CTO trial. Decision CTO was presented in a late breaking clinical trial at the American College of Cardiology Scientific Sessions this year. And it made quite a splash uh, with some real controversial headlines, and it really activated uh, the tweetosphere. We had lots of tweeting by U.S. doctors about CTO-PCI indications. So we're going to mention briefly the uh, current guidelines. Uh, we're going to talk about registry data, meta-analyses. We're going to talk about decision CTO and Euro CTO, and then focus on whether or not we need more research or whether we have the research trial that we need to inform our decisions about who to treat with chronic total occlusion angioplasty. First of all, CTO angioplasty is a class 2A indication with both the ACC Foundation uh, and the European Society guidelines for revascularization. The uh, ACC Sky document specifically states that it should be done for appropriate patients with appropriately trained operators, but don't provide any insights really about how to appropriately train an operator. So I just wondered quickly from the group what do you think constitutes good training in chronic total occlusion angioplasty, and what would you define as an appropriately trained officer uh, operator? And we'll just start with Dr. Harding, who spends a lot of time training CTO operators. Scott, what kind of things do you do to tr train somebody adequately? I think uh, in the current era, uh, an expert CTO operator needs to be not only competent in antigrade uh, techniques, but ideally uh, retrograde uh, as a minimum and also ADR to have a full range of options to get the best options, uh, best outcomes uh, with the lowest risk. So ideally we should be looking to uh, have uh, operators who are trained in all three methods of uh, opening a CTO. Uh, I think there should be a minimum volume, uh, ideally you can argue what that is, but I think uh, you should have done at least a couple of hundred CTOs. Um, this may be you know, a, a reasonable benchmark in my view. All right. I think one of the other important function or keys to being an adequately trained operator is that you can have high success rates, low complication rates, uh, and you can do that without a lot of case selection. You can do that by treating patients who have good indications, not treating patients just because you think you can get the procedure done. And maybe that's something we can cover a little bit more uh, later. The document does provide some guidance on appropriate selection of patients. And in the U.S. and other places, we could use the ACC Foundation's appropriateness use criterion to make sure that we're selecting patients properly. This document uh, is for all types of revascularization, not just CTO, and not specifically PCI. This is supposed to be a technical panel's ratings of the appropriateness for PCI uh, I'm sorry, for revascularization in general, and, and essentially the document suggests that the higher the symptom burden, the greater the medical therapy that's been used, and the greater the risk reflected in the degree of ischemia on non-invasive imaging, the more appropriate it is to intervene. And I think that's something that we uh, all try to keep in mind, that a patient who has a small ischemic burden of 5% who has no symptoms has nothing to gain from a procedure, whether it's surgery or PCI. And so you can use these. I was part of the 2016 update on appropriateness use criteria. We've actually taken away CTO specific recommendations because of some evidence we'll show you in just a minute, but it's our share with the group in just a minute. But it doesn't make sense really to make CTO specific recommendations because we didn't make recommendations about bifurcation disease or calcified lesions or any other lesion subsets. We also dichotomize into symptomatic or asymptomatic and we dichotomize into low risk and not low risk because who wants to be an intermediate or high risk patient? So there are some updates to the AUC that we can use and we can use those uh, to define the most appropriate patients and we think that might be important. When it comes to asymptomatic patients, we're focused really on trying to help people live longer. So I just wanted, Dr. Muramatsu, what's your feeling about the ability 
of interventional cardiologists to prolong the life of patients with chronic total occlusions, we, we often hear that the only opportunity we have to save a life is with a STEMI. But what do you think, just what do you feel uh, in your gut about the evidence for um, our ability to improve survival with CTO angioplasty? Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, the indication of the CTO PCI is a more uh, sensitive because based on the many, many randomized trial was, uh, as you know, the already published. And first of all, is I, I trying to the choice the patient has a symptom or not. And the symptom uh, means a b more viability. So, so if you open the CTO, the patient just pain the relief and the quality of life is uh, better than before. This is a, one of the many uh, big issue is the uh, advantage of the uh, open, open best cell therapy. But the uh, uh, long, long term outcome is uh, it is necessary to collect the data. So uh, as you mentioned, so if you open the very small territory of the, the vessels, it's a long term benefit is very, very minim minimal. So right. We try to collect data is uh, the, the major vessels CTO uh, patient is collecting. It means, uh, I think, uh, more uh, beneficial to, for long term. So to date, the data that we have consists of real meta of, of single and multi-center, prospective and retrospective, but no randomized trial data. This started from my institution, from the Mid-America Heart Institute. We published our 20-year experience in CTO PCI in 2001 and showed that uh, success compared to failure was associated with a survival advantage associated with, not cause and effect, retrospective analysis. There have been about 30 trials now, five different meta-analyses. All of them have shown the same thing, that whether you look individually at the studies or you look at the grouped data in a meta-analytical process, you find about a 50% uh, risk reduction for mortality with success compared to failure. But these are multiple studies, uh, again, uh, that are confounded by the potential for unaccounted for bias. You know, they do all kinds of adjustment, but can never account for every, every form of bias. Uh, and those could, you know, that can be uh, anything you can think of and a lot of things you can't particularly think of. So clearly needs to be uh, more data for asymptomatic patients. At the very least, we'll have the ischemia trial. It's got some problems with it methodologically, but we'll have some more information from ischemia to decide if ischemia-based decision-making makes sense. But as, as Dr. Muramatsu alluded to, the majority of patients we see have symptoms. 75% of the patients in a registry called the Open CTO Registry were treated, and the doctor said he was doing the procedure to improve the patient's symptoms. And they had a really high amount of uh, baseline symptomatology. This is data from a different registry where my colleague David Safley from Mid-America Institute looked at the Seattle Angina Questionnaire domains, Rose Dyspnea scale scores, and the EQ5D, some health status scores at baseline in six months after successful CTO-PCI, compared those to patients who had successful non-CTO-PCI and showed that CTO-PCI is non-inferior to non-CTO-PCI for symptom relief when you ask patients how they're doing. So, so Dr. Lee, how does the myocyte know a lesion is 80% occluded or 100% occluded? This data suggests the myocyte doesn't know. It'll give symptoms regardless of the degree of narrowing. Uh, as you know, the uh, CTO is a totally different from the stenosis because of the sometimes the good collateral function patient, even proximal early stenosis uh, occlusion patient, is, mm -hmm. salium spec is normal. Yeah. Uh, around 5 or 10 percent. So, so how does a patient who's completely asymptomatic get a thallium spec test? Why do they get a test? What led them to that? Uh, recently, there's some... Just uh, random screening? Yeah, yeah. We have, in our country, the health promotion screening is the popular. Yeah. Nearly all population is have, uh, screened the, uh, based on the uh, EKG. Yeah. So there is some problem. We really routinely check the CT and geography. Are you aware of a study that is population-based and suggests that there's a high frequency of patients with CTOs and no ischemia? Uh, based on our data, is the around 10 percent of the salary uh. spec is normal. And the, mm -hmm. based on our data, is the asymptomatic patient around the 20 or 30 percent. So you can say that around 10 percent of patients with CTOs have good collaterals. Yeah. But the rest don't. 
the rest have abnormal thallium uh, tests yeah, or yeah, symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And as I alluded to in the open CTO trial, 75% of the patients were treated because of symptoms. Their collaterals, by definition, are not good enough because they have symptoms. So this notion that collaterals are good, it's for a very small proportion of the patients. And as we alluded to, using the appropriateness use criterion, if a patient has no ischemia and no symptoms, you can provide them with no benefits. Even the RAD? They shouldn't be in a... Uh, Proximal RAD? No ischemia, mm -hmm. no symptoms. What would the benefits be to the patient? Mm -hmm. You could hypothesize the double jeopardy phenomenon. You could suggest, well, if they're dependent on the right coronary artery, but very few patients are dependent on the sole source of collaterals. Most of the patients who have collaterals have them from both of the other arteries. So those are, those are all provocative statements, but the real, uh, you know, the real meat, I would say, suggests that there are not a lot of patients who are non-ischemic from a CTO. I think we also need to differentiate between ischemia and viability, because patients may be non-ischemic because their viable muscle is non-viable, in other words, it's dead. So there is a group of patients that can have silent infarction right. and be left with a CTO with non-viable muscle mm -hmm. and have no ischemia. And certainly we don't want to be doing anything. Yeah, yet another group who stands to, to gain no benefit from CTO-PCI. If the CTO subtends infarcted myocardium, there's, there's no advantage to treating them. Well, here's some more data from, from OPEN. Uh, again, this was presented at ACC this year. And I just wanted to give you a sense for the baseline symptomatology and ischemic burden. I'm sorry, and baseline symptomatology and medical therapy among these patients. These are 948 patients who had paired baseline and one-year uh, uh, data. Uh, so out of 1,000 patients, we had paired data in these 948. And if you look at their symptom classification by CCS class or by Seattle Angina questionnaire, if you, do, if you ask the physician or you ask the patient, the mean Seattle Angina questionnaire angina frequency score was 70. This is substantially impaired patient from angina. Their SAC summary score, SAC summary is a mean, it's an average of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire Angina Frequency, Physical Limitation, and Quality of Life scores. It's 62. That's pretty low, uh, suggesting pretty high symptom burden. And the other thing that's fascinating is that 92% of these patients were on two anti-ischemic drugs. So these were patients who were selected for CTO-PCI using the AUC rubric, using that, that particular methodology to select. And if you look at those patients stratified by the degree of benefit they obtained, so those with a modest improvement, a 10-point, which is clinically meaningful, an intermediate and a significant improvement, if you look at the patients who were appropriate, 80% of them had a 10-point improvement and 50% of them had a 30-point improvement in Seattle Angina Questionnaire uh, Angina Frequency, which is a massive improvement. What's really interesting here is that some of those inappropriate patients felt a lot better too. 50% of the patients who were rarely appropriate by the new nomenclature had a substantial improvement in their symptomatology, had a 10-point improvement in, in symptoms when they had CTO-PCI. So I think these patients, when they're selected, uh, or at least the patients that were selected in open CTO, had a lot of symptoms. They were on a lot of medical therapy, which may not necessarily be the case for a lot of the studies that were done out there. And then we come to the Decision CTO trial, and this is going to be the focus of our next 12 minutes of discussion here. See, open uh, Decision CTO is the first randomized trial of CTO-PCI versus optimal medical therapy. So PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone for patients who have a chronic total occlusion. These patients could have multi-vessel disease. They had to have treatment of their non-CTO disease first, and then they were randomized. Uh, to PCI or, Mac, uh, or optimal medical therapy for their uh, CTO uh, disease. They were followed for three years, and the composite of death, MI, stroke, and any revascularization was the primary endpoint. And Dr. Lee, do you want to say anything about the trial design or have any insights for us uh, from the Korean experience here about decision CTO, the trial design, and... and uh, By me. Huh? By me. Mm -hmm. So initially, we tried to... The at that time, when I designed this uh, trial, the PCI is uh, better than, all data is PCI is better. Mm -hmm. So, however, uh, when I, in real practice, the, I saw so many patients is stable during the medical treatment because of the, some patient is comorbidity, we cannot do that the PCI. So, 10 year, even the 15 year, there is no event. Right? So, and then we analyze our data, we already published in the, the 
among the one of the meta analysis, the, there mm -hmm. is no difference of the survival and myocardial infarction. Yeah. There is some difference of the target region revascularization. So uh, we designed the maybe, uh, I think that there is no standard treatment in CTO. Medical is standard, I don't know. PCI standard, I don't know. So we, when I designed these trials, uh, maybe post treatment is uh, uh, effective in, in my perception. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of the most uh, CTO patient is stable patient. So I, I want to try to, to make the, uh, which, which tra treatment is better. However, yeah. my boss, SA, wanted to know the, because of his patient also, the, so many patients are stable during the medical treatment. Yeah. So I kind of have the opposite experience. I, as a CTO operator and recognized around the country as a CTO expert, I get referrals from all over the country for patients who failed medical therapy, who aren't stable, who aren't happy, who have severe angina on their angina frequency scores, who have depression. Some portion, some portion. So, <laughs> so I have a referral filter bias, right? I see the patients who failed medical therapy, uh -huh. and sometimes I wonder from people who never see these patients whether they're actually seeing all the patients back or whether their patients are seeking care elsewhere, and they're getting a referral filter bias because the patients who stay with them are the patients who are better. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting question. So here's one of the issues I have with the decision CTO trial. And that is SJ's fourth slide, which says, I believe the pathophysiology CTO is totally different with that of high degree of stenosis because they can't rupture and they have good collaterals. And the, to me, that's an expression of intellectual bias. Yeah. He has a mechanistic uh, reason for not believing in CTO PCI. So it's very hard for somebody with an intellectual bias to design a trial that's not biased. And it's not a statement of ethics. It's a statement of the power of bias. It would be just as problematic as me designing it, who's so convinced that I'm helping all these patients so much. It should be done in collaboration, I think, with people who are not so convinced. Uh, and intellectual bias could have influenced the results of the trial. One of the other concerns about the trial is the number of stents. And this is, I'm interested in your comments on this. Yeah. Both of these groups of patients had similar frequencies of multifessal coronary artery disease, and all of them had to be treated up front for their non-CTO disease and then randomized. How in the world do you explain this issue where the optimal medical therapy group got two stents per case and the CTO-PCI group got 2.4 stents per case? I can explain. Because of the OMT population, is nearly 50% is the received a stent. The main 50% did not receive the stent. So among the PCI patients, we the, uh, make the mean. So all of the old population, stent, uh, stent number is 1.3. This number is the, among the PCI patient. Oh, that's not, so the N is incorrect in this table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, you better correct the table because that's a very misleading, yeah. suggest you only put in 0.4 stents per CTO, no. which is impossible. No, no, no. Okay, uh, and that, that may uh, jive with the, with the total stent length as well. Um, again, uh, this is the medical therapy that was used, uh, about 60% of patients on a beta blocker. How much anti-anginal drug therapy was used uh, among these patients? Would, in other words, was this a, a trial of sort of first-line PCI versus deferred for medical therapy failure PCI? Which one of those would be the patients you entered into the trial? Uh, uh, beta blocker is the... Is the, as you can see, the relatively lower than, uh, yeah. than expected. So, however, in our country, the, uh, the AB blocking agent such as the like the diltiazem or other uh, medication is uh, uh, sigmat, other other anti-angina medication, not first line or, or the other medication. Mm -hmm. Maybe symptom is improved. That we don't add the beta block because of the uh, heart rate uh, relatively. All the patients have the, some concern about the, the AB blocking agent. So, in our country, so doctors, this, this was predominantly first-line therapy PCI with very little back. Yeah, we had, yeah, we yeah, had yeah, yeah, Ninety-two percent dual anti-anginal drug therapy in open CTO, and you guys had yeah, yeah, very yeah. little medical therapy. The patient is, uh, and and this more than ninety percent is received two anti-anginal medication, not first-line or second-line also. Yeah, received with the second with the after randomization to the yeah, medical yeah, therapy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So the other problem with the trial that's well known is the premature termination. The DSMB said things are going too slow. Yeah. We need to stop this trial. I don't know why DSMB would say it's not a safety issue. It was just slow enrollment. SJ told me about this at our Hawaii meeting in 2013. He told me the trial was going to be negative and nobody wanted to enroll. And when you look at the enrollment rates, they're abysmally low. And one of the things that we should talk about is who should do CTO-PCI research because if we do another study in interventional cardiology and don't enroll a large proportion of the patients who are eligible for the trial, the trial should be stopped. These, you, you, on average, you ordered six, uh, each center enrolled six patients per year in this trial, which is a terribly low number for a group of cath labs that are probably doing 1,000 PCIs a year minimum. So there's a real problem with selection yeah. bias that went into this and every other trial of yeah. strategies like courage. We continue to do this to ourselves in interventional cardiology. We refuse to enroll the patients we know are going to benefit because we can't stomach the idea of watching them suffer in clinic on medical therapy, and we don't enroll the ones that would, would benefit. So this was the study flow that we don't need to go. They, despite being so short on their enrollment, they still somehow met their non-inferiority margins, even though that wasn't the pre-specified uh, number that they needed to, to make that uh, uh, statistically significant, but it was. Uh, this is the as-treated, I'm sorry, the intention to treat population, and this is the as-treated uh, analysis where there was a trend toward benefit. And the importance here is that 20% crossover rate counted as uh, being, you know, getting medical therapy, but they ultimately got PCI. And 10% of the PCI arm never got PCI for some yeah. unexplained reason. Probably patients bailed out or yeah. didn't want to. Yeah participate. But so 30% of the patients in general didn't get treated in the arm to which they were assigned, which mm -hmm. again, a major problem with strategy trials that mm -hmm. interventional cardiologists are always guilty of and really precludes us finding out the truth. And we're not able to hold these patients into the arm to which they're randomized. And it really is confounding some of the results of our studies. So that's a, that's a major concern, I think, uh, with this trial. The other concern is if you look at the um, numbers in each group, the three-year follow-up rates were only about 20 or 30 percent. There are very few patients who've been followed to the three-year rate. And so we'll need to see the data uh, there. This is to point out that the baseline symptomatology reflected in angina frequency scores is 82 points, whereas in open CTO it was 70 and that SAC quality of life scores are in the 60 range and they're 50 range with the open CTO trial. So these are, by and large, less symptomatic, less well medically treated patients, certainly not refractory patients, but uh, this is a trial of first-line CTO PCI versus medical therapy. This really doesn't reflect the types of patients we're treating, at least in the U.S. Uh, open CTO. Scott, is, is PCI used in, in uh, uh, New Zealand as first-line therapy or as uh, therapy for patients failing medical therapy? How does PCI fit into the treatment algorithm of these patients? So uh, in most cases, uh, it's used as for symptomatic patients because what we know about PCI for stable coronary disease is it's good at relieving symptoms. Yeah. Um, we don't have data on improving mortality. We have data, not good data. Well, not good data. <laughs> um, I stand corrected. Um, in terms of do we do PCI in asymptomatic patients? Yes, we do. Uh, so if we have a patient with a large burden of ischemia, uh, then, for example, an included LAD where we have a large burden, proven viable uh, myocardial, proven ischemia, we'll certainly do that. It does depend on the age. Do we do that in 82-year-olds? No, we don't, uh, in general. If we have a 50-year-old who's got a lot more to gain, uh, then generally we do. So. Uh, mostly for symptoms uh, after medical treatment, but when there's a, a, a moderate, at least uh, often large burden of ischemia, we will do asymptomatic patients. I think that's a good segue into the last couple of minutes of our discussion, and that is why are we looking for a survival advantage? It's going to be terribly difficult to prove. It's never been proven in elective stable coronary artery disease. Uh, there's some interesting um, meta-analytical data um, from Stefan Windecker on modern stenting uh, with modern drug-eluting stents, uh, uh, suggesting there may be an association of survival advantage with better DES, more uh, third, second generation DES, but uh, it's really not been proven. And so it's a difficult metric to meet, and uh, most of what we do is alleviate symptoms. So I think Gerald Werner has designed a really nice trial called the EuroCTO trial, 
This is the flow diagram. Essentially, it's going to be patients with symptoms. Multivessel disease patients are going to be treated with their non-CTO disease. When they have a single vessel CTO disease or, and treated non-CTO disease, they'll be randomized. They are, they've been randomized two to one with PCI, with DES, plus optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone. Again, 300 patients in the PCI arm, 150 patients in the medical therapy alone arm, and then they're going to be followed by uh, one year health status assessment with a primary endpoint, efficacy endpoint, a quality of life at 12 and 36 months, and the safety endpoint of uh, death, non-fatal myocardial infarction by intention to treat, and both per uh, protocol um, analysis at 36 months. So this is then focused on the symptomatic patient, by and large the reason we do PCI in elective patients. Uh, the one thing that concerns me about this is the exact same problem in the interventional research culture where it took them four or five years to enroll 450 patients. Operators in the Euro CTO club, there are three operators in the Euro CTO club that do more than 300 PCIs, CTO PCIs a year. Wow. And it took them five, four or five years to fill this trial. Incredible case selection. Part of it is just the difficulty in randomizing patients. Part of it is operators aren't truly committed to finding out the truth. And they're not willing yet to ask their patients to be patient, stay in the trial. We don't believe that there's going to cost them their life. It's just going to cost them their quality of life for a year. Yeah. Things to consider as we move forward. If we have any time left, we can discuss what would be the next research trial in CTO-PCI. Do you think we have all the answers? Should we stop CTO-PCI, Dr. Lee? Should we shut down the CTO theater at TCTAP <laughs> and not have it any more this year or next year? I'm also a CTO crazy guy. So, <laughs> however, we, I wanted to know, know the role of the OMT because of the, so many patients still receive the medical treatment in real practice. Yeah. Because of non-intervention, non-CTO intervention cardiologist dealing with the 90% of the CTO patient. CTO guys, I think the, around 5% in the world. So I wanted to really lo want to know about the, the OMT role. Just it. I, I agree the CTO PCI is, have uh, some role. How, and the, the OMT also have a role. Right, so. so what's your takeaway? Do you understand the role of PCI better now? And what's the difference now compared to before decision CTO? Uh, the d detailed analysis showed that uh, in our decision CTO treatment, as a treatment population, the PCI is benefit in ACS, LV dysfunction, and prior stroke, and multivessel disease. However, multivessel disease is the same finding predict in the both arm, PCI arm, Medical arm is predicted for future event in even the P PCI or OMT group. So I think the ACS, LV dysfunction, prior stroke patient is benefited from the PCI. However, atrial fibrillation patient is benefited from the OMT because of the tri triple medication is maybe some problem to the, up the PCI. So an atrial fibrillation patient who has class 3 angina on 3 anti-anginal drug therapy, you would still treat them with anti-anginal drug therapy or you would yeah. treat them with PCI? Uh, if, if the patient is, uh, symptom is more than 2 or 3, I, I, do, I do PCI. So that's the one thing I agreed with with decision CTO. The conclusion slide was CTO PCI should be reserved for patients who have failed medical therapy. Yeah, yeah, the definition yeah, yeah. of failed medical therapy now needs to be sorted out. Is that two drugs? Is that all four drugs? Is it everything the patient can afford? Yeah. Is it everything the patient can stand to take? And if the yeah. patient can't stay, stand to take anything because of side effects or cost, can we do PCI? I think those questions are yet to be answered. What is optimal medical exactly, therapy? Exactly, exactly. Uh, however, you cannot do that. You know that that kind of person, we cannot randomize the PCI versus the medical treatment yeah. because the patient, the symptom is not controlled. So, right. So well, that's where I say I think the next trial is a trial of patients who failed two drug therapy. Uh, it's to take the appropriateness use criterion. Two drug therapy with at least 10 percent of the LV mass ischemic. That is a courage trial. Hmm? That is a courage trial. That's not the courage trial. Uh, no, 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 no. The courage trial is a, the vast majority. Of, it's a third of the patients in the courage trial had mild or no ischemia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> had mild or no <laughs> symptoms. Uh, this is quite different. This is the the appropriateness use criterion applied, uh -huh. and then decide whether you continue to advance medical therapy or whether you use PCI in an intermediate stage mm -hmm. rather than an initial or an incredibly late stage. Mm -hmm.
Scott, any thoughts on the trial you'd like to see in CTS? Yeah, oh, look, I, I think there is a, a need for another trial. Unfortunately, you know, some of my colleagues are referring to, the, to this as the courage trial of CTO PCI. It is. Um, it's low-risk asymptomatic patients. And, uh, and applying the results to all CTO patients, uh, which I don't think uh, is appropriate. I think uh, while subgroup analysis of this trial can give us some hypothesis, it's a negative trial. Subgroup analysis of a negative trial is a dangerous thing. I do think there's a, a, a need for another trial. I think the primary endpoint should be based on symptoms. Uh, I think that is the most important thing. The real challenge for us is to design that trial and to be, get a committed group of people to enrolling symptomatic patients and us as operators have a big role in convincing patients to take part in that. And if we don't believe in the trial, sure as hell the patients aren't going to believe in the trial. Right. Well, I think that's all well said and a good way to wrap up. We're out of time, so I appreciate everybody's contribution to the uh, wrap-up session here for CTO. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of TCTAP. It's a great meeting. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.